Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the one hour chart of silver, and you can see here I've drawn in the trend lines. It's in a trend channel, that's very clear. Uh, this uh, spike out due to some Euro news, etc., has now resulted in a downside. So, uh, except for the outliers, which we, we could probably draw a couple more channels in here that have to do with the outliers, but but basically, this is the major trend channel. The question is, will we break below it? And that will give us some fantastic buying opportunities. Now, you know, I covered recently the spot uh, price for the 90% silver and also the eagles. And there's a lot of others that are starting to blow out. So just because the price goes lower, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to get those coins. Um, that's what happens. We saw it in 2008. We saw it to a lesser extent in 2011. But uh, I was reading one of the comment, uh, commenters on Silver Doctors, and he was around stacking during the 2008 period in 2009. And what he said, and I agree because I saw it, was that it didn't really matter where the price of silver went. Silver Eagles really never went below $16. So as far as you know, being able to buy it, that, that's not necessarily going to follow the price down. Now I want to check a couple currencies here because we're going to revisit Mad Maduro down there in Venezuela. I think it's important because we're, we're looking at the craziness that's going on in Europe. And for me, it's actually all related. They're all socialists. They're all... Uh, technocrats, they're all collectivists, they're all central planners. And what they do results in disaster. And of course, let's start looking at the Argentinian currency. And what's interesting about currencies is that this actually violates all the laws that you would have about any kind of market at all. Because the way, because it's fake. Anytime the government controls something, it's not a real market. Now, we're seeing this all over the world right now as these technocrats, bureaucrats, collectivists, central planners are trying to keep this system going that they've created. But you can see here, this chart violates everything you know about markets. We know that when something goes up in a parabolic manner, it's going to crash. In other words, the value of this Argentine peso should have gone up after this, but it didn't. You can see it just did that spike and here we go. It's worth less and less and less every day. Now, that's nothing compared to what's going on in Venezuela. You can see that's nine to one. So it's moved from really about four. It's really just lost 50% of its value over the course of a, a large number of years, at least three years, three plus years. Now in Venezuela, uh, it's it's a much much worse situation because uh, this guy, this Mad Maduro down there, he is an absolute lunatic, and I'm going to show you uh, some more stories and show you the stories that I covered before. But before we do that, let's look at the fixed rate that we have here. This is the Venezuelan Bolivar. That's their currency. You can see that it's pegged. It's been pegged at the official rate of 6.28 to the dollar since uh, about early 2013. Now I'm going to take you to the video that I did in January talking about this. And we're going to see here how bad things have gotten since then. If we go back to the black market rate, you can see the black market rate is actually 175 to 1 to the dollar. And here's the different rates. You have the official government. There it is right there. That's the one that we saw in NetDania. There's the official government rate, 6.3 boulevards to the dollar. Then we have these different rates that the government allows certain people to use. You've got 12 to 1, 51 to 1, 90 to 1, and then the actual real black market rate, 175 to 1. So if you're doing transactions at the official government rate, then you're losing anywhere from 90 to 95% of the value of your currency. So if, for example, you went to stay in a 
hotel in Caracas and they quoted you the official exchange rate, then you would be paying roughly 20 times what you should be paying if you went out to the black market, got the bolivars and came and paid for that. That's what happens when you have a government that's foisting its currency off on its own people. So let's go back to this uh, economic story. So that's the way it was back then. Now let me show you how bad it's gotten since then. This is the same site. This is Dolar today. Now it's very hard to find charts. I've looked for the charts. You can't really find them, but you can see here we're at 621. So the Bolivar has lost 75% of its value since I did that last video. And you can see that the official peg here of the Bolivar is 6.28 to 1, and it's now at 621. So the official rate is 1% of the real rate. In other words, they've lost 99% of the value of their wealth. The people living in Venezuela have lost 99% of their wealth. Now, I was researching this today and I came across a blog of a backpacker. They have these backpackers that uh, like to travel the world and live on pennies and do things like that. And this, this guy was talking about backpacking in Venezuela and he said it was the greatest thing in the world. Now, he had, he had $100 bills on him that he brought with him. He had to hide them. He actually uh, hid them inside of pictures that he was carrying because you'll get robbed by bandits and and uh, you know it's a uh, it's an interesting experience if you want to go to one of these countries but you have to be very careful to not get robbed but there's a video of him and it shows the hundred dollar bill and then he goes to the black market and exchanges it and he has a stack a huge stack. it's like Zimbabwe um, but uh, for him, the, the cost of beers were 10 cents. Uh, it was 10 cents a beer. For a hotel room, it was a dollar a night. And food was virtually nothing. So, you know, now people say, well, you're taking advantage of those people. Actually, he's not taking advantage of those people. These backpackers may be some of the only people, except for the Colombians coming in there and bringing in hard currency to the poor Venezuelans that are being destroyed by this lunatic this bus driving lunatic Maduro. Now let me show you how bad this is. It's gone from bad to worse. Um, just uh, today, there's a news story that the opposition party, now every, everybody knows that if you live in a country where you've lost 99% of your wealth that's held in the currency, it's not likely that the president's gonna be reelected. Well, the way you take care of that, if you're a dictator, a communist dictator, is you outlaw the opposition. So Venezuelan government bars opposition leader from holding public office. One of Venezuela's most prominent opposition leaders announced Tuesday that she had been barred from holding public office as critical election looms. Former lawmaker Maria Corina Machado posted a notice on Twitter saying, Comptroller's office prohibited her from holding public office for a year, which could prevent her from taking her seat if she wins one of December's congressional elections. She did not say why she was barred, but she apparently has the option to appeal the decision. The Comptroller's office could not be reached for comment. Machado is among hardline leaders who called for President Nicolas Maduro to resign last year. Oh, it would be so great if he would have done that and helped lead sometimes bloody street protests demanding an end. Of course, they were bloody street protests because uh, Maduro sent his goons in to uh, bloody the protesters. Demanding an end to the South American country's socialist administration, the ruling party stripped her of her congressional seat amid the protests. So now, and, and that's what you see with dictators. They outlaw the opposition. And it just goes from bad to worse. Here's something else that you see with these socialist communist, collectivist dictators. While Venezuelans can't buy fries, potato seeds rot in state silos. This is from yesterday. Earlier this year, we, we reported that McDonald's in Venezuela could neither import potatoes to make fries nor find a reliable supply domestically. Now we know why, and not just because of currency controls. Venezuela's National Seed Service has been asleep at the switch and let 175 metric tons of potato seeds go rotten in state silos. 
when locals discovered the magnitude of the waste on July 8th in excess of all potatoes produced in 2014, they took to social media and could hardly contain their outrage, describing it as the official self-imposed economic war. A delegation from the National Federation of Potato and Vegetable Producers of Venezuela made the discovery in the state of Merida, 700 kilometers southeast of Caracas. Producers then assembled at the Ministry of Agriculture to present formal accusations and demand an explanation from the authorities. In Venezuela, silos are the responsibility of Senesem. The state agency function is to carry out all activities necessary for there to be a continuous, sufficient, and timely supply of seeds in the different areas needed by the country so that production caters to the demand of the domestic market. So there, there's your explanation right there. You don't need to search any further. This is a perfect example. Uh, their purpose for existing is to have a continuous and sufficient and timely supply of seeds. And we know the only thing that can provide a continuous and sufficient and timely supply of seeds is the free market. When you have government cronies uh, who are under a dictator who also are afraid to make a profit because people who make a profit are considered profiteers and jailed or their business is seized by the state, then of course it's, it's more in your interest to just let things rot than to actually try to do something that's efficient. So that's how bad it is in Venezuela. Uh, it, it, it's just unbelievable. But it gets worse. This lunatic, this madman, this man that needs to be immediately removed from power and put in prison or an insane asylum, he is now talking about trying to annex two-thirds of Guyana, the neighboring country. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is facing staggering a staggering array of problems, far too numerous and severe to list here. Things were already going badly before global oil prices tanked, so now they're a lot worse. With Venezuelan crude down to about $50 a barrel, Maduro's government has been devouring its foreign currency reserves and plunging deeper into debt, though not fast enough to keep supermarkets stocked. Annual inflation is the highest in the world, and the country's largest bank now 100 strong boulevards is now worth 17 U.S. cents on the black market. The country may soon run low on beer. It might come as something of a surprise then to see that the Venezuelan president's most pressing concern in recent days is not a shortage of milk, surgical supplies, or contraceptives. It's a vigorous and noisy campaign to take control of a large swath of South American savanna and jungle known as the Essequibo that belongs to neighboring Guyana. For the past several days, Maduro has been assuring Venezuelans, many of whom are busy queuing up for groceries and basic goods, that his government is working to achieve a great victory and take control of the disputed Essequibo, an area equal to two-thirds of Guyanese territory. So there you have it. This lunatic, and that's what you have with socialist madmen, when their policies fail, um, they, they drive their country into poverty, they destroy all industries in their country, and then what, what do they do? They become warlords and try to seize the wealth of the neighboring countries. So this man needs to be deposed. Um, th this would be one instance where I would not object to the CIA and their long-held uh, history of going in and deposing foreign leaders. If the CIA went and deposed this man and put in some free market person, I would actually cheer. That's how bad it is. Uh, I just, I, it makes me so upset. This, this man is destroying the Venezuelan people. But again, remember what we saw in Greece. The Venezuelan people voted for him. They also voted for his predecessor, uh, Chavez, the communist. And so when you put these people in power, these people don't leave power. Uh, these people are insane. They, they will never admit that their policies fail. They will blame them on mysterious enemies. They will try to attack their neighbors. Um, you put these people in power and you're going to have a very hard time getting them out of power. Now, a lot of members have asked about Bitcoin and uh, what's going on with it. And so it, it's hard for me because it's something that I've done for a long time. 
and I understand it, and it's hard for me to understand what people don't understand. So I'm gonna gonna try to do the basics so people can figure it out. Now, now Bitcoin is the common currency. It's the dollar of of the cryptocurrencies. So if you want to get into cryptocurrencies, then you want to get into Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is going to be the most stable, partly because the price is so high. You can see it's $300 a Bitcoin. Now, if you remember when I started doing my Bitcoin channel, well, unfortunately, it's not on this chart, but Bitcoin was $2. It came from one cent. And so now that Bitcoin is around $300, it's a lot like gold. It's so high priced, it becomes stable, much more stable relative to the others. So if you're going to get into cryptocurrencies, you want to get into Bitcoin. Now you can see the most recent rally we have here from the recent low. And this is going to be a 90% decline because we came from about 1200 and we went down to about 167, about 90% decline. Nothing like the 99% decline in uh, the Venezuelan Bolivar, and it's not coming back. But you can see that Bitcoin has bounced back. It's doubled from there to it recently hit a high about 316. So just about a perfect double. And uh, so it's it's fairly stable. Now, if you want to get into it, the one that I use and the one that most everybody uses is, is Coinbase. So Coinbase is a FinCEN approved, government approved operation here in the United States where you can sign up an account and I have an account with them. The price you can see here is 287. Now that's the price that we had on the that's the chart we're looking here. Now don't be confused because there are other charts. You've got uh, BTCEs at 279. There's going to be a difference, partly because they're located in other countries, partly because some of these are going to charge a fee. Uh, for Coinbase, I think it's like five bucks. So you're gonna there's going to be some added on there. But basically, you need to go into Coinbase. You're going to have to identify who you are. This is not. Um, something that you can do, like I said before, where you can go to the exchanges like Bitfinex that I described, where I sent some Bitcoins over there. You have to remember that if you're sending Bitcoins, you don't have to identify yourself. But if you're sending dollars, you have to identify yourself. So with Coinbase, I set up my account early. I don't believe I had to send in my, uh, my driver's license or something like that. But I did link a bank account and I did link a credit card. It takes a while for your bank account to clear. You've got to approve some transactions. Then you link up a, a bank uh, credit card as a backup, and then, then they'll. This gives you the ability to buy bitcoins. Now, if you don't want to wait, because there's normally a week turnaround between when you buy the bitcoins and when you get them in your account, and that has nothing to do with Coinbase. It has to do with the bank delays that happen with with banking so the way that coinbase has got around that is that if you also add a credit card then they give you an instant buy limit and it goes up by a certain amount every day so it's not unusual to have a thousand dollar instant buy limit and then what you do is you transfer that money into your linked account and your credit card acts as a backup and if you want to just pop in and buy a thousand dollars worth of bitcoin that's what you do as soon as you bought them, you can send them anywhere you want. I'm not going to log in and show you my wallet because I don't want to show you all that information in my private account. So once you've done that, it's pretty straightforward. You sign up, you link a bank account, you link a credit card, then you can buy Bitcoin. Now, once you've got your Bitcoins, you're definitely going to want to have a wallet. Now, this is now this is going to be the same case with every cryptocurrency. It just little bit little different variations, but pretty much all the same. There's going to be a main site for Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin.org. For Litecoin, it's Litecoin.org. And then as you go down into the smaller and smaller alt currencies, it's going to be different sites and you have to do some research on that. So you're going to want to get a wallet. Now, with Bitcoin, it's going to take a while to get the wallet, but I would recommend that you click on this link, Getting Started with Bitcoin. Then you have a link, Choose Your Wallet. And then you have Bitcoin Core. Now, Bitcoin Core is going to be the software that has all of the blockchain in it. The blockchain is a history of all transactions that have ever happened. So 
If you do that, you're going to click install and you're going to download Bitcoin Core. And you can see this is for Windows and I'm on a 64 bit. So you're going to download this wallet. Uh, once you download it, I suggest you put it on a partition that doesn't, where you don't, space is not critical. And probably put, it'll give you an option when you're installing to put the blockchain off on some area. I use another partition on my computer. So that my main uh, partition, which is a solid state drive, doesn't have that entire blockchain. Because remember, the entire history of every Bitcoin transaction with this Bitcoin core, you're actually downloading the history of every transaction that's ever occurred. It's about five years worth of transactions. So put that on a, a partition that's not important. It, it'll run fine. Once you do that, you're going to have that software called Bitcoin QT. You're going to run that software and you're going to get a wallet. Now, I don't have a Bitcoin wallet here on this computer. So I'll go ahead and use my um, Florin coin wallet, which doesn't seem to be moving here. Let me uh, try to move this. Actually, I'll go ahead and start a different wallet here. Um, I'll start my spots wallet. You have to remember that these wallets are pretty much all the same. You have one or two types of wallets. You have a um, Litecoin based wallet and you have a Bitcoin based wallet. Um, the difference is that the Bitcoin wallets are based on SHA-256, which is an algorithm that requires uh, processing power on your um, G GPU, your GPU cards. Those are the ones that usually, um, I'm sorry, I'm, it's not uh, letting me have the wallet. So unfortunately, I can't show you that. Um, let me see if I can fix this. So uh, the main one is Bitcoin, and that uses the SHA-256 algorithm. Whereas Litecoin uses script algorithm, they're just a little bit different in the way they work. And so, there we go, I think I have it here. So this is the, well maybe not. Okay, so this is my spots wallet. We'll just use this one. Um, you can see I have about 3.3 million spots here. And uh, let's see if I can get my foreign coin over here. Yeah, there's the Florin coin wallet. So you can see on my Florin coin wallet, I have about 1.8 million Florin coin. And uh, so this is the what you're going to see. They pretty much all look the same. The wallets are either, like I said, either based on Bitcoin or on Litecoin. They're very similar looking. You just have, now this is, this is a proof of work coin. Remember, there's a difference between proof of work coin. Proof of work coins are the ones that have the miners. That's where you see all these ASIC miners and all these millions and millions of dollars invested in mining. And that's where you get all these nodes down here, uh, seven active connections to the network. Uh, this is just a small coin. If it's Bitcoin, you're gonna see 40 or others higher than that. That's all those miners out there that are talking to you. So if you have a proof of work coin, that means you have a whole bunch of miners. The one I showed you yesterday is a proof of stake coin. It doesn't have a lot of miners. So uh, you don't have the ability to go into this wallet and have settings where it can mint coins. This wallet, Florin coin, and also this wallet, Spots, uh, these don't actually mint any coins. They just receive them. So you have the ability to send the coins. You just put in an address, put in the amount, and click send. You have the ability to receive coins. You have an address right here. You just copy the address paste it into the box that uh, the, whatever site you're on, whether it's exchange or whatever it is, send it and uh, just click OK and it will send you those coins. You can see these are the coins I've received in this wallet. There's the addresses. I've sent them back and forth. I showed you that in the past. So that's pretty much it. Now, once you have that down, you might decide that you want to start trading these coins. Now you can do that by going to the various sites. Um, like I showed before, I use um, Cripsy. I also use um, Bitfinex, uh, Bittrex a little bit, and BTC-E. Those, those are going to be some of the main sites, um, but you have a huge number of coins that are trading. 
I usually check on a daily basis. When I wake up in the morning, uh, the, the first thing that I go to is I go to Bitcoin Wisdom and check the Litecoin US dollar. One of the reasons is because I piled into these, probably piled in too soon, got in around four or so after this crash, and you can see it's, not, it's still correcting. So I may have to sit on these coins for a while. Um, after I go to Bitcoin Wisdom and I check you know, the, the price of Bitcoin and the price of Litecoin, and I've showed you before, you can check all these other markets here. There's Coinbase, there's the Chinese markets. Then I'll normally go to the World Coin Index and I will check the trending coins. And uh, that, that usually shows you which coins are moving up and down. You can go in and take a look. Uh, here's one, I, I haven't seen this before, Orange Coin. It's moving very fast, it's up 118%. Uh, one of the first things I look at is the market cap. So there's about $73,000 in market cap. And I look at the number of coins, there's 52 million coins. I look at what exchanges it's traded on. It's only exchange uh, traded on Bittrex. Now, I don't like that. I don't like to use Bittrex. I don't like the exchange. Uh, I want to see a coin listed on a lot of exchanges. Now, the latest thing I'm doing for looking for altcoins to invest in is I'll show you what I do here with the volume. So I'll go to exchanges and uh, we've already seen here, I showed you before, if we go to 24 hour volume, you can see here, the, the volume is coming out of China. 65% of all cryptocurrency volume is China. Uh, and the US is 32. So you can see there between the United States and China, you have 97% of all cryptocurrencies. Europe comes in at 2% and Canada at nothing. So I always want to look at the Chinese exchanges. So I'll go to exchanges and you can see this UOB. This is top here at 34 million. Now, a lot of that's going to be Litecoin. You can see here Litecoin's coming in at 23 million volume. Now, the other one I will check here is this uh, BTC 38. And the reason why is because this gives you a window into what the Chinese are going into other altcoins because this is one of the only big Chinese exchanges that has the other coins on it besides Bitcoin, just Bitcoin and Litecoin and maybe Purecoin. So you can see here, Litecoin tops the list. You've got Doge, Ripple. Uh, uh, as I said before, I stay away from that because it's centrally controlled. Bill Still, those people. Blackcoin, BitShares, uh, that was the guy that I did the interview with recently. Primecoin, Purecoin. So, uh, this is the one I like to keep an eye on to see what's moving and what's not moving. This is what the Chinese are doing. If you remember, I said before, said it about the Lunar series, that uh, if you want to become a billionaire, Jimmy Rogers said, you want to find something the Chinese want to buy and you want to sell it to them. Well, that's certainly going to be true about the Lunar series, I believe, in the future. But I also think it's going to be true about cryptocurrencies. And so I keep an eye on this to see what the Chinese are doing. If I see a chart pattern that I really like, I may step in and start to buy some coins, see if I can catch an uptrend. So that's hopefully a summary that you can understand. It's like I said, it's hard for me to know what I don't know. And so if there's something that I haven't explained, go ahead and ask in the comments. So we still have that downtrend intact. It's it's still very strong. These, these things go for a while and until they turn around, uh, they're very strong. It's amazing to me that we're actually pushing and testing 2006 highs on the silver price. So for me, a $15 silver is cheaper than it was in 2003 on an inflation adjusted basis. So I would definitely say at this point, you can stack without any thought at all. It's just easy, just buy. And we'll talk to you next time.